You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Now I'd like to move on now to introduce you to Michael Greenstone. Michael is, by chance, the Milton Friedman um, professor at the university uh, since 2014. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, his achievements. He is um, doing amazing research in multiple fields, energy, public finance, labor, health economics, and uh, he, has, uh, he has, this is interesting, he has had funding for his research from the National Institute of Health, the National uh, Institute of Health and Child Development, the National Science Foundation, Sloan Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, dot, dot, dot. I'm not going to read it all off. But in order to do, be doing research that these many these, these institutions have with their different mandates on what kind of research they want to fund, it's really a, um, a testimony to Michael's varied research interests that, that, that he has successfully done research for so many. <clears throat> um, so I think I leave it to you to ask exactly how do you get to a place where Michael is now, because I think I leave that for the Q&A. Um, but his, uh, he was at college at Swarthmore, PhD from um, Princeton, and he's been an assistant professor for four years at University of Chicago before going to that other school in Boston, MIT, and then coming back to us in 2014. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, I don't know if Michael agreed to this, but you know, despite the fact that at this point in his re life he's, he's spanning all these really hot button issues, um, I think he probably emphasized for undergraduates, you do the methods and the modeling first. And then later in your career, you go looking for the policy issues of interest. If you don't do your homework, your groundwork, then it won't be that you'll be able to contribute to the basic research on these on these policy issues. So, with that, I hope you, I'm I'm not. He's not going to get up here and go no. <laughs> Michael Greenstone. Thanks very much, Grace. Uh, thanks for the being gentle about the 11 years of insanity when I was at MIT. <laughs> Key thing here is I'm counting on this being a real Chicago audience, uh, and that means if there's something that bothers you or something that is unclear or something that is just distressing in some way, I'm going to count on you uh, to speak up. Uh, so I thought I would talk a little bit about the Global Energy Challenge, uh, 10 Facts About Energy Growth and uh, Public Policy, which is kind of pulls together a bunch of facts that I think many of you probably know, but maybe are strung together in a slightly different way, and some other themes uh, can emerge from them. So uh, the first, uh, I want to begin, this, this is one of my favorite pictures, uh, and I think uh, this captures what I think is the global energy challenge really well. And uh, what is at the center of the global energy challenges, uh, challenge is, I think, three goals. Uh, and or three problems maybe, three issues to confront. Uh, the first, uh, and th this is a picture from Beijing, it's taken from the New York Times, uh, and anyone who's been to China knows that picture, uh, and you can, the first, but the first goal uh, or feature of the Global Energy Challenge is just like the visceral action and motion. And you can see it wasn't very long ago that the guy in the cab was on the other side of the gate and maybe on a bike and that the guy in the bike was on the other side of the gate and was walking. And you know, in the last 25 years, China has engaged in a basically unprecedented increase uh, in human living standards, uh, pulling hundreds of millions of people out of poverty uh, and altering uh, the nature uh, for largely for the benefit, for the good of people's lives. And the, but what this picture so effectively captures is that a lot of that is driven by energy. Uh, and uh, the guy was able to get off the bike because he had access to inexpensive and reliable energy uh, in, in the car, and the guy on the bike is going to try and get off for the same reason. So the first part of the Global Energy Challenge is how do you get access to inexpensive uh, and reliable sources of energy? The second, uh, you can think of it as the second leg of the stool, uh, is also really visible in this picture. Uh, and this is the middle of the day. 
uh, and you can't see the sun, and that happens in Beijing with some frequency and lots of other cities as well. And that's because the energy that is powering the, guy, the guy's car and all the uh, economic activity, most of it is from fossil fuels, and it leads to this level, uh, these le really extraordinary levels of air pollution. Uh, levels of air pollution that are basically unrecorded uh, in human history. And our guy on the bike is extraordinarily aware of this. Uh, it's not a secret. Uh, he's got the mask on. I don't know if that's like a Hello Kitty thing or what it is, but it's some <laughs> kind of cartoon. Uh, he's got the goggles, uh, and it's a little bit covered up, but even has gloves on. Uh, so it's not a secret that this is a byproduct uh, of all the energy consumption. And then the third leg of the stool, or the third goal, uh, or so maybe this, to be precise, the second is how do you uh, not have these tremendous levels of air pollution that have such terrible consequences for human well-being uh, when you have lots of energy consumption? And the third leg of the stool is related. Uh, the same fossil fuels that are producing that air pollution are also leading to the emissions of tons and tons of CO2. Uh, and that CO2 is causing the planet to change. It's changing it, the climate is changing at unprecedented rates and we don't fully understand what the consequences of that will be. But so the three legs of the global energy challenge, uh, the stool, the three legs of the stool that comprise the global energy challenge, I think are how do you get access to inexpensive and reliable energy for the hundreds and millions, even billions of people around the planet who need it? Uh, how do you do that without exposing people to uh, concentrations of air pollution that undermine their well-being? And then how do you not, at the same time, not cause disruptive climate change? Uh, and so we'll try and talk about that as we go along here. So the 10 facts. Uh, so the first, uh, as I said, some of these you'll know very well. Uh, and actually, this is a great audience uh, for this. So no, when I've given this talk before, it's uh, to people a little bit older than you. Uh, and I always say, well, remember back when you were in high school. But it's not that hard for you guys to remember when you were back in high school. And if you think back to high school, uh, think what was like the worst boyfriend or girlfriend that you ever had in high school? Uh, and so you can all get a mental image of who that person is. And then what character, what made them the worst boyfriend or worst girlfriend that uh, could have ever existed? And at least maybe you guys all had much more successful dating experiences than I did. But in my case, it was that they would let me down in like a new way every single day. Like, uh, like a kind of unpredictability. Uh, what was certain was that I would be let down, but the exact nature of it was always slightly unpredictable. So working with data is a lot like the worst boyfriend or girlfriend that you ever had. Like data always disappoints you. Uh, just when you think it's going to show something, uh, it always manages to show the opposite. The next graph runs completely counter to that. Uh, and this is a graph on the x-axis. Uh, we have log GDP per capita. On the y-axis, there's uh, energy consumption. And what's striking about that is there are just not historical examples of high levels of uh, living standards without high levels of energy consumption. Uh, it, it just it, it, it doesn't exist. And so this is like not like that terrible boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, this is showing a very clear uh, and strong relationship. So fact one is energy is critical for growth. Uh, fact two, energy access is a uh, major problem uh, around, the, uh, around the globe. And there's a couple ways to illustrate that. Uh, just as a benchmark, in the US, we consume about 13,000 kilowatt hours uh, of electricity per person per year. Uh, in Europe and Russia, it's maybe closer to five to 7,000. Uh, but there are huge swatches of the global population that don't have numbers that approach that. China is about 3,000. There's, of course, almost 1.4 billion people there. But then you get to Pakistan and India. And then the state of Bihar, which is in India, uh, has a population of 100 million people. That's a third of the US. Per capita electricity consumption is 120 kilowatt hours uh, per year. So a lot of the world, so while energy access is critical for growth, uh, a lot of the world is at very low levels of energy consumption, uh, and perhaps not surprisingly, at very low levels uh, of economic well-being. OK, that's fact two. Uh, fact three almost falls right out of it. 
Uh, demand is expected to grow rapidly uh, in developing countries. If you are living in Bihar, you are not thinking this is okay. You would love to get up to China's level or Russia's level. Uh, and indeed, uh, if you look, uh, so here's just uh, up through the present, you can see energy consumption per capita in the US across all sources of energy has been roughly flat since 1965. And then uh, red here is India, and I guess we call this green is China. Uh, and you can see both of them have uh, increased uh, since roughly 1990. But uh, China has had a much sharper increase, and it uh, is to be expected, I think, that India will increase over time as well. Yes? So it takes me on one slide to catch up. So the Bihar number, is that including energy like cook stoves? Or no, so this is off the grid. This is off the, this is off the grid, yeah. Um, if you were to have a reliable way to add all that up, it would still be an unbelievably low number. Okay, uh, so there's lots of room to grow, and indeed all the projections for what's gonna happen, uh, here's some projections uh, from the uh, EIA, are that there'll be very modest growth in the rich countries, that's the gray here, the OECD countries, in the next 25 years, and there'll be a near doubling uh, in what are the non-OECD countries. So all the future consumption growth is projected to occur uh, outside of uh, developed countries. All right, now, so that's fine, that's good. We want people consuming more energy. Uh, a challenge, though, is that fossil fuels are projected uh, to meet much of this growth. Uh, and indeed, you can see that through the present, uh, fossil fuels, uh, so this isn't labeled, but the three gray ones are uh, coal, oil, uh, and natural gas, uh, account for almost all of the supply and then the, little, uh, the, uh, the consumption in the world, and the little bits above are uh, nuclear, hydro, and then I think Mr. Green there uh, must be uh, uh, renewables. Uh, which you can see is still a, a very small share. Uh, so today, uh, the fossil fuels account for about 86% uh, of worldwide energy use. That's not projected to change much. Here, you're taking it out uh, to 24, uh, to 2040. Uh, and uh, by 2040, they're projected to account for 75%, and that would be these three bars, uh, and, and the others would be renewables, hydro, uh, and uh, nuclear. And you can see uh, the renewables are expected to grow quite a bit off of their base, but still only account for a relatively small uh, portion of it. Uh, it's worth noting that there has been some, there have been some substantial changes. Uh, at least here's, this is in the US case. This is the share of US power generation by fuel. Uh, and you can see there's been a very sharp decline, which is almost mirrored by an increase uh, in natural gas. A lot of that is driven by what people refer to as fracking. Uh, and there has been some increase in renewables, uh, but they're still at a very low level uh, in, uh, in terms of supply. They're just 7% of generation, uh, although that's up from 2% uh, in about 2000. Uh, it's worth noting also that uh, there's been basically no nuclear plant construction uh, in a long time. There's one or two underway right now, but those are heavily subsidized by the government. And so most of the nuclear fleet is actually projected uh, to have its license, their licenses uh, expire in the next, in the coming years. And without extensions of those uh, licenses, although many of them are probably, will get lic licenses, extend them beyond the length of period of time that people ever thought they would operate, you can see the nuclear fleet is kind of projected uh, to go down to zero over time. So if you're interested in uh, fossil versus non, this is uh, maybe a, a, a less positive sign. Okay, but so why are fossil fuels uh, such a dom why do they play such a dominant role uh, in the energy sector? Uh, and the, uh, so I, since we're in the economics department, sometimes you have to explain this a little more detail, but in the economics department, we probably don't have to explain this in much detail. Uh, the reason is they're cheap. Uh, and uh, here's the co levelized cost uh, of producing a, a megawatt hour. So think of the, just think of this as a, a kilowatt hour uh, of electricity produced from a natural gas run plant is about 6.8 cents. Uh, a conventional coal plant, so that's a coal plant that faces all of the uh, environmental regulations that currently apply in the US is maybe 8 cents. By the way, a plant, a coal plant without those regulations is probably only three cents, so it's very, very cheap. 
Uh, and then we can come uh, to uh, low carbon energy sources. So here would be wind with a natural gas backup. So that's a somewhat, it's like, I like to call that a Frankenstein plant. Uh, there's a natural gas backup because the wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, and so you have to have something to fill in the gaps. Uh, and then we have nuclear and hydro and, uh, and solar. And so the point I just want you to take, we're gonna come back to this and the limitations of this. Uh, but the point I want you to take away is the reason fossil fuels are projected to play such an important role going forward uh, and that they play such an important role today is that they are very cheap uh, relative to alternatives um, and uh, you know people may at least they're very cheap based on the cost of producing them and we'll talk uh, a little bit about a broader definition of cost in a minute. Oh, So this is a uh, new graph, it's a paper that I put together, uh, it's a graph I put together for a recent paper that I did with Tom Covert, who's at the Booth School, and Chris Knittel, a colleague of mine. And uh, so that was in transportation. So why are fossil fuels so predominant? So the previous slide was in uh, uh, the power sector. This is in transportation. So why are fossil fuels so dominant in transportation? Well, again, uh, it's because it's so inexpensive uh, to run things with them. And so this is a slightly complicated graph, and let me try and uh, hit, hit, hit the big points here. Uh, on, on the x-axis, we've got the cost of a battery. So that's like a lithium, lithium ion battery that would go into a car, uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, the price of oil. And what I tried to do is build two separate cars here. Uh, one car is an electric vehicle. Uh, and one car is a regular old internal combustion engine that you, uh, car that you would run on, on, on gasoline. Uh, and holding everything else constant, this red line is the point at which, uh, with a standard assumptions about how much the car will be driven, uh, peop it's uh, equally uh, costly to use uh, a patrol uh, ICE car, that is internal combustion, versus an electric vehicle. Uh, and the, I guess we call this uh, the pink, pink area is where the internal combustion engine cars are cheaper than electric vehicles and the blue area is uh, where the electric vehicles are cheaper than ICEs. And so this is projecting out uh, to 2020. And so now let's just look at a few points along this indifference line, uh, the point where it's uh, equal cost. And I think they will help put into sharp relief how far away we are uh, from moving to this world uh, of electric vehicles. So if you took what Tesla is not currently selling, but is claiming that they're gonna sell, uh, it is a, uh, uh, their battery uh, that, would, that is meant for houses, but it could also be used for cars, is that the cost of that is uh, $350 uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, to, for an electric vehicle to be just, uh, no more expensive uh, than a petroleum car, it would have to be the case that a barrel of oil uh, in 2020 is, who can read this? $470. Okay, so uh, just to make sure everyone's paying attention, what does a barrel of oil trade for now? 33, yeah, okay, so it's more than 10 times. Uh, and you can just move, and so then we could take other things like uh, the DOE's current estimate is actually a little bit cheaper than the Tesla one, it's 325, that would need a barrel of oil at $420. Uh, the DOE's projection of what the cost of batteries will be uh, in 2020. This is a projection, uh, is 125, and that would require a barrel of oil to be 115. Futures markets probably have it at 50 or 60. Uh, and then, oh, so here you go, the December 2020 WTI oil futures price, uh, of, which is projected to be $55, would require the break-even cost of batteries uh, would be $64. So we have a long ways to go uh, until the kind of beautiful uh, day of uh, electric, uh, the, the day that many people uh, have their eyes on of electric vehicles. Uh, one thing that's worth noting that is sometimes people miss uh, is even if you, we switch to a world of electric vehicles, you still have to plug them into a grid and if that grid is primarily fossil fuels, it's not clear that you've made much of a dent uh, in fossil fuel consumption. Uh, Okay, it's also worth noting uh, that not only are fossil fuels cheap, but fossil fuels are, like it's hard to walk around and not stub your toe on a fossil fuel, essentially. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to show this. This is a slightly misleading, the coal line is a little bit misleading, but what this figure is, uh, is the ratio of reserves uh, to production 
ratios. And so think of that as how much we know is available and can be gotten at today's technologies uh, and today's prices, divided by how much we use that year. And uh, this, I'm plotting this uh, year by year. And what's striking is if you just look at like Mr. Blue, uh, in 1980, which was 35 years ago, there were about 35 years of reserves uh, available. Uh, and if we had never ever found another barrel of oil, uh, that line would have gone down and it would have been zero here. Uh, but instead, uh, this line is flat. So who can tell me what that flatness of that line means? They're increasing at about exactly, or maybe even quicker, uh, than the rate at which we're using them. Uh, and so, and that's also true uh, for natural gas. And so what the important point uh, that I think comes out of this is, we're not gonna run out of fossil fuels, we're not gonna run out of inexpensive fossil fuels uh, in any time soon. So it is true that y there are only a finite amount of fossil fuels uh, buried underneath the ground, but they, uh, our ability uh, to find them shows no real, uh, n no real probability of slowing down. Uh, you know, the guys at Schlumberger are really smart and they work really hard to do this. Uh, and uh, I think if one wants to transition away from fossil fuels, it's gonna have to be by finding ways to make uh, the other sources, low uh, non-fossil fuel sources, uh, beat fossil fuels uh, in the marketplace. And we'll come back to that as we go on. Uh, so we don't have time to go into this great deal, but I'll just note uh, the fracking uh, or, uh, has really been an incredible game changer uh, in the energy sector. Uh, and the fracking is primarily, is done in places where there are shale deposits. Uh, thus far, it's around the world, it's basically only been done in the US and maybe some in Canada. Uh, but the discovery that we could have inexpensive natural gas and petroleum come out of the shale deposits, everyone knew that the petroleum and natural gas was there, they just thought it was too expensive. This new technique to get it out inexpensively has just started to be exploited, as I said, in North America. And once it spreads to the rest of the world, our reserves or supplies of fossil fuels uh, are, are only gonna uh, increase dramatically. And so here's one way to measure that. Uh, you could think like, well, like how much did fracking uh, change the world? Uh, and you know, the addition to worldwide supplies, you could think of as you know, maybe 10 or 15 years worth of petroleum that kind of just fell out of the sky uh, in the last decade. And then with respect to natural gas, you could think of that as you know, 65 or 70 years uh, worth of supplies just kind of appeared, of inexpensive supplies, just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Okay, so I think an important question to have in mind, and this is a coal train in China, is uh, is there an endless supply of fossil fuels? And I think with respect to legs two and legs three of the stool, I think you should be thinking that the answer is yes. We're not going to run out of them. All right. So now let's talk about why that might be good or bad. And we're going to talk about two, uh, a couple, the second and third legs of the stool that are problems about fossil fuels. They, you know, fossil fuels are incredible in the sense that they allow us to produce energy very, very inexpensively. Uh, and now we'll talk about some byproducts uh, of using lots of fossil fuels. Uh, and so the first is that uh, fossil fuels increase pollution uh, or air, standard air pollution and that shortens lives. To illustrate that point, I'm gonna talk about a recent paper of mine, uh, which uh, we just started circulating a draft, uh, which builds on a previous paper. Uh, and it asks, uh, what are the consequences of sustained exposure uh, to air pollution? And it uses uh, uh, an example from China. So I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out uh, that at least certainly wasn't true at MIT, and I'm, I haven't tried here. Uh, I'm sure that no university in their right mind is ever going to allow me or any other researcher to run a real randomized control trial where you expose people to different levels of air pollution over their whole life. Uh, and there's probably very good reasons for that. And so that has made it difficult to understand, well, what are the consequences of long-run exposure uh, to air pollution? And this quasi-experiment or natural experiment is a, a potential solution to that. 
Uh, and so what the paper builds on is a policy that China had that comes out of the planning period. Uh, and that was a period when China was much less wealthy than it is currently. And a judgment was made that there's not enough money here to provide winter heating for everybody. And, uh, and so uh, what we're going to do instead is we're just going to heat roughly half of the country. Uh, and uh, to do that, they provide free coal uh, to a bunch to, uh, uh, and set up boilers throughout northern China. And this, uh, the free coal is provided from November 15th to March 15th. And indeed, the legacy of this policy carries on. Uh, but due to budget limitations, this free coal program only exists north of the Huai River. Uh, and the Huai River basically, by, and I'll show you in a second, bisects the country into two. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is no longer the case, but indeed, uh, during at least the early years of this, heating was forbidden in the South. Uh, but in, in recent years, as the market economy has taken hold, heating has started to expand uh, in the South. But the key thing is there's free coal in the north of China, uh, and people use that for winter heating. And I'm going to then ask two questions. What are the consequences of that for air pollution concentrations? And what are the consequences of that for life expectancy? Uh, so here's an example of a northern city. And you can see, we like in, uh, th there's all these very small and inefficient boilers without uh, any pollution control devices on them. Uh, this is, uh, and you, know, you can see practically every building has their own. And you can see the pollution uh, coming out of it. This is not how it's done. Uh, you know, when you have a central generating system with uh, some giant boiler and scrubbers installed, but uh, rather this is uh, done in this particular way in the north. Uh, it's worth looking at the line for a second. So here's the line. If you're to the north of the line, and the idea of the paper is to compare people just to the north versus people just to the south, uh, there's free heating. I gave a lecture at a university in Chengdu a couple years ago. Uh, Chengdu, as you can see, is in the northern part of the south, so the winters are actually pretty cold. Uh, and it was in a room not that dissimilar to this room. And you know, I was a little cold giving a lecture. There was no heating in the building, and all the students had on winter jackets. And so like, this is just a standard thing, uh, and pe uh, people are used to it. All right, so the first primary result from this uh, is that pollution is 50% higher north of the river. Uh, and the way that you can read this graph is uh, the zero, zero you should think of as uh, the Huai River line. And then these are one, these data points are uh, one degree uh, latitude uh, increments to the north and one degree latitude increments uh, to the south. And what you can see is that there is this very sharp increase right as one crosses uh, from the south to the north. So that is uh, as one goes from here to here. Uh, and it's worth about uh, 42 micrograms per cubic meter of uh, uh, of PM10, which is a air, form of air pollution that's thought to be the most pernicious uh, for human life. So this is a setup. Uh, it's not very surprising that there, if there's uh, free coal and more coal consumption, that there's more air pollution. Uh, and I, I should add, you know, the baseline levels that are in the south are, are, are very high. Uh, you know, in the U.S., PM10 is probably, I don't know, it's, you know, in the teens or below 10 or something like that. Uh, but what I'm now going to show you is a graph of life expectancy set up exactly the same way. Yeah. What's the reason for the decline the farther north you Is that just population? Yeah, I think that's population. Uh, and we could spend a lot of time on the statistics behind this. But the essence of this idea of looking just to the north and just to the south uh, is that there's lots of differences. I don't know what all of them are uh, to the north and the south. And so the, the idea is to focus the comparisons right at the, play, uh, right at the line. And it, it's called a regression discontinuity design. Um, OK, so now we're going to look uh, at life expectancy and see if there's a mirror image. Uh, and indeed, that's what you see. Uh, so the intended beneficiaries of this policy uh, actually appear to live about 3.1 years uh, less uh, then uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the beneficiaries of this policy are these guys, so I have it backwards. Uh, these guys who are in the north appear to live about 3.1 years less than otherwise identical people who are uh, living to the north. And because I've focused the comparisons right at that line, uh, that lends some credibility to the claim that it's uh, related to air pollution. And indeed, uh, when you, uh, I, I, I don't have the graph here, but when you, you could run this same test at one degree latitude increments. Uh, so instead of at the Huai River, but one degree north test if 
just to the north of the one degree north line versus uh, south of that, uh, you see anything. And the only place that you see this is right at the Y River. And you, in, uh, nowhere else do you see either a jump in pollution or a decline uh, in life expectancy. So if you put that together, uh, what I uh, conclude, or what we conclude in that paper, is that an extra 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air pollution, uh, or PM10, are worth about 0.64 years uh, reduction in life expectancy. So it's really a dramatic change uh, in people's well-being. Uh, what lends further credibility to the results is that the decrease in life expectancy is concentrated uh, among cardiorespiratory causes of death, and there's no evidence of elevated rates of mortality for causes of death that are not plausibly uh, related to air pollution. And if you did a little exercise of you know, what happened if you brought China into compliance with its own class one PM10 standard, that would save an additional 3.7 billion life years. So air pollution is really uh, a nasty and dramatically uh, bad feature uh, of fossil fuels, at least if the air pollution isn't controlled. It's worth noting uh, this air pollution problem, PM10 problem, is not unique to China. Uh, and so this is the world. You can see, uh, you can see, you can really almost see the Y River line there. Uh, and you can see there's also this band uh, in northern India that has very high levels of PM10 concentration. Uh, and parts of Africa and the Middle East uh, also have very high levels uh, of PM10 concentrations. Uh, actually, that graph was PM 2.5, but it's the, it's the same idea. Okay, so the next fact uh, is the third leg of the stool, is fossil fuels are causing climate change. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to show this. Uh, here is kind of the standard way, uh, which is just showing the projected change uh, with some confidence interval of uh, global mean temperatures. Now, you guys are all young and probably very facile uh, with metrics. Uh, when I was in school, it, every year that it was kind of like clockwork, the teachers must have been yelled at, I can see this now with hindsight, the teachers must have been yelled at by the principals, you know, we're going to switch to metrics, you have to get them to switch to metrics. Uh, and the teacher would try for like three days and then would give up and we would go back uh, to the English system. And so I've never really understood what a degree Celsius means. Uh, and so I have a very hard time with that. So instead, I like to think of things, uh, and by the way, I don't understand what global mean temperatures are. So instead, I've created this graph, which uses uh, temperature data and climate data, as I'll show you in a second, the climate projection data, which is, and I can understand this, the number of days that the temperature falls into two degree uh, uh, buckets. Uh, and so this is, you can make it for any country. Here I've made it for India. And so you can see the typical uh, Indian faces 60 days a year where the temperature is between 79 and 81. That's actually pretty hot uh, because that's the mean, so it's the average of the high and the low. Uh, and you can see that there's you know, some days at the very high end and then uh, it's not like Chicago where there's uh, basically no days below 49 in India. So this is the historical distribution. I think this is from 68 to 2002. Let me show you, or from 57 to 2000, let me show you what's projected to take place uh, by the end of the century, just to give you a better sense so you don't have to think about Celsius and you don't have to think about global mean averages. Uh, and you can see there'll be this like enormous movement of the distribution so that there's a piling up of really hot days. And that's important because in some of my research and a lot of other people's research, uh, all, a lot of the bad stuff about temperature is not if averages go up by two degrees, it's what happens when there's really, really hot days. And what we have found from that literature is that there's very elevated rates of mortality uh, on those hot days. Uh, crops have a very hard time. Uh, there's even evidence that people become less effective at work uh, on very hot days. So that gives you some sense of uh, what climate change is projected to look like. You know, it's already true uh, that there's evidence of a warming uh, planet. This is uh, Al Gore's famous hockey stick graph. Uh, and uh, just so, remember we talked about all those fossil fuels that are abundant and cheap. Uh, I, the scientists like to talk about them in terms of gigatons uh, of CO2. I, again, that's like a concept that I don't really get. So what this graph is, it just shows you, uh, I decided to turn the deposits of fossil fuels that we are, know about uh, instead of uh, into 
the amount of energy they produce or gigatons of CO2 instead of in, into what the temperature change will be. Uh, and so what you can see here is we've baked 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit into the si of change into the system. If we were to use fossil fuel reserves, that's coal, oil, natural gas that we can get at today's prices with today's technologies, that's an extra almost three degrees. Uh, and then there's in the energy sector, there's something called resources. Uh, those are things that we know are there, we can get with today's technologies, but we would need a higher price. Uh, those would uh, add about an uh, extra three degrees uh, from just using oil and gas. Uh, and then it, it, there's essentially an infinite amount of coal, uh, at least with respect to climate change. And you can see that that's worth about another seven and a half degrees. So we got like 15 degrees of uh, warming. Now remember, I said the, uh, the guys at the fossil fuel companies are not dum-dums uh, and they are always working to get access so to convert some of these resources into the reserves category and to look for new sources. So in addition to all that, uh, there are other categories. So think of these as like fracking 20 years ago when people knew it was there but didn't know how to get it. Uh, and so there's also oil shale that people are going after uh, and methane hydrates. So again, there's, with, at least with respect to climate change, there's way too many fossil fuels. We can't use them all uh, without probably exposing ourselves uh, to disruptive climate change. Okay, uh, so let's just review where we are. Uh, energy is critical for growth. Uh, energy access is a major problem. Today's developing countries are projected to greatly increase uh, their energy consumption in the coming decades. The current economics of that all point to fossil fuels. We got lots and lots of fossil fuels, and they're cheap. Uh, and, uh, but the fossil fuels shorten lives and appear to be running the risk of causing disruptive climate change. So can we reduce uh, greenhouse gases? Uh, how difficult emissions, how difficult will that be? And so the fact seven is that it's going to be pretty challenging. And let's take a look at why that is. Uh, so the first is, this is, you could think of Mr. Red here uh, as uh, the no, no policy, kind of uh, no policy uh, version of the world, uh, where the world doesn't get together and really reduce greenhouse gas emissions. By the end of the century, we'd be projected to have uh, global temperatures that are about eight degrees uh, higher than they are pre-industrial. Uh, if every country followed through on what they promised in, uh, Paris, that would uh, be appreciably lower at about 6.3 degrees. But you can see the gap between Mr. Red and Mrs. Blue here is what the, the magnitude of the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, those are expensive. And how do we, just to humor me, how do we know that that would be expensive to go from red to blue? This feels like a trick question, but it's not. Because the alternatives you need to employ are much more expensive than the fossil fuels. That's what we looked at, yes, exactly. So uh, you should think of the, these gaps as the magnitude of the costs uh, that we'll have in terms of uh, the private costs. And I'm going to come to uh, social costs in a minute. Uh, and then you can see the scientists all talk about 2 degrees C, and it would require a really pretty monumental reduction uh, in greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And uh, I, my own view is that there's nothing magical about the two degrees C. Uh, and you can also see from this figure, it's a really, really a, a, a aggressive reduction compared to a business as usual uh, scenario. Okay, now uh, we're building uh, the case here a little bit. It's not only that they're more expensive, but what's, uh, what you should also have kind of intuitively know already uh, is that most of that uh, reduction in expensive electricity consumption is going to have will, will have to come from uh, today's developing countries because that's where all the growth is going to come from. Uh, and so one way to show this is just to look at under business as usual scenario what share of cumulative so like since the industrial revolution do uh, does the United States as one example and China and India, India as another category account for. So as of today's cumulative emissions of CO2 uh, the U.S. accounts for 22%, uh, China accounts, China and India account for 16%. It's worth noting that like on an annual basis, uh, China's already at about 70% higher, or 50-70% higher 
uh, than the US. And indeed, that's going to change very, the cumulative numbers will change over pretty quickly. By mid-century, the US's share would be down to 16%. China and India's would be up to 30%. Uh, and by the end of the century, uh, China and India's would be almost 40%, uh, and the U.S.'s would be 12%. By the way, I'm, there's no implication here that these are somehow incorrect ratios. There's many more people uh, in China and India than there are in, in the U.S. But the important point is that if we're not going to have disruptive climate change, uh, the reductions in greenhouse gases are going to have to come it, uh, from inside these countries. Uh, and so let me put a fine point on that. Uh, you know, incomes are low in China and India. And what that means is that you have people uh, leading sicker and harder lives uh, today, They're not because something like climate change has come in a couple decades. And so effectively, the world is in one way, you know, you can dress it up, but in one way or another, the world is asking for those countries to either consume less energy than they were going to or to consume more expensive energy. And actually in economics we kind of think of the two as the same thing. Uh, more expensive energy leads uh, to less energy consumption. So that's the challenge. Uh, I think in a nutshell, the, the, the climate challenge is uh, you have people who uh, need the increase in energy consumption the most who are effectively being asked to reduce uh, that, uh, that energy consumption. Uh, of course, there are several ways to get there. One is they could pay for it themselves, and I think those countries are going to be reluctant to for exactly, if you think back to what life in Bihar is like with 100 kilowatt hours per person, uh, or there could be uh, you know, transfers from rich countries to poor countries, but you know, for anyone who's been uh, following the presidential election, I think it would be, maybe the right way to say it is it might be a little challenging uh, to run on a campaign of uh, shipping billions, tens of billions of dollars a year uh, to developing countries to help them buy more expensive energy. Uh, it's not even clear that, uh, that, you know, there, that that is a controversial topic in the United States itself, much less uh, sending that money abroad. Okay, so uh, it's also worth noting that there are several problems with the way that the energy system is set up around the world. Uh, and uh, in particular, pricing of energy is screwed up in three really obvious ways, uh, all of which I think are highly amenable uh, to policy uh, uh, improvements. So the first is uh, uh, repayment rates are really low. So what do I mean by this? So this is, uh, and these numbers are actually lower than the truth. So let me just give you an example. I have a lot of work going on in the state of Bihar currently, which is why it wasn't accidental that I emphasized Bihar earlier. Uh, the distribution, electricity distribution companies in Bihar, it's a little bit hard to get a precise number, but it, it's about the case that for every dollar of electricity they put on the wires, they only take in about 50 cents in revenue. So uh, you do not have to have passed an advanced economics class to understand it is very, very hard to run a business when every dollar of sales leads to 50 cents of losses. And uh, indeed that uh, uh, it, you can't run one, which is why these distribution companies are almost all publicly owned. And so how can you, they even exist? Uh, and the way they exist is really pretty simple. Uh, they just withhold supply. Uh, and they can only lose so much each year. You know, they have fancy names for it, like load shedding and brownouts. But those are just fancy names. At the end of the day, they're choosing not to put electricity on the wire. Uh, and the reason is uh, because they know they won't be paid for it. Just like any other business uh, that uh, made a loss on each sale, eventually that business would go away. Uh, so I think there's tremendous opportunities to get people to stop thinking of energy as a right and more as a private good. Uh, and that conversion would make these distribution companies more sustainable and I think in turn would increase the supply uh, of electricity. Uh, so that's problem number one. Uh, problem number two is energy uh, remains uh, highly subsidized in many parts of the world. Uh, and uh, you can see some countries have astronomically high share. Saudi Arabia is like 12% of GDP is devoted to energy subsidies. That leads to really inefficient use of energy. Uh, and that poses problems both in terms of air pollution uh, and CO2. Uh, and then uh, it's also worth noting those energy subsidies are often 
motivate it by uh, providing opportunity to uh, direct resources to low-income people, but it's a really ineffective way to do that. Uh, and the reason is, you know, low-income folks don't consume much of anything. So if you give them a subsidy on something, not much of that subsidy is going to hit them. And indeed, most of the subsidies of these various sources of energy uh, go to upper-income people. Some countries are, ex uh, India is experimenting a little bit with uh, replacing these subsidies uh, with uh, cash transfers. Uh, and then the third, which is really kind of spot on with the discussion we've been having about uh, the three legs of the energy stool, is, well, in these prices, which we looked at earlier, there was nothing about what are the costs imposed, so externalities, what are the costs imposed by uh, air pollution in terms of people's health, and what are the costs in terms of the likely climate damages. Uh, and so if you were to add those to this picture, so Mr. Green here is the carbon cost, and uh, Mr. Red uh, is the health cost from air pollution, suddenly the picture really changes dramatically. Uh, and so let's go through that somewhat carefully. So if you looked at a conventional natural gas plant, before I think it was $68 uh, per megawatt hour, now it's 94. Uh, and so that's an increase, and that reflects uh, that reflects the CO2 and the air pollution that also is a byproduct of combusting natural gas. You can see coal, which looked quite inexpensive, is now very expensive. Uh, and you can see some of the low carbon energy sources look more competitive uh, than they did. And in fact, nuclear, which is effectively completely out of the market around the world right now, suddenly looks like it might not be such a bad technology. Now this doesn't include the cost of uh, nuclear disasters. I don't know how to monetize those, but, uh, and those shouldn't be ignored. But the point I want you to take away from this is we have an energy system around the world that does not account basically for externalities. It does not account for the full cost of consuming uh, different forms of energy. And the result is that we get pushed into, the market leads us uh, to using these and emphasizing the fossil fuels, but you could end up with a very different result if those costs, uh, the social costs, were reflected uh, in market prices. Okay, uh, so that leads to some very obvious uh, policy uh, implications. You know, number one, if people actually were required to pay for the product, there might be a greater supply. Uh, number two, energy subsidies are really expensive and seem to exacerbate inequality and inefficient consumption of energy. And number three, pricing energy based on the full social costs offers uh, great opportunities for reducing health uh, and climate damages. All right, uh, so I think we're almost out of time, and so I'm just going to blaze through the last two points. Uh, I think energy is a little bit like energy and environmental questions not always, but with some frequency have a kind of uh, quasi-religious element to them where people just believe things. Uh, and I think a key component to getting a good energy system that facilitates growth and human advancement is being honest about what works uh, and what doesn't work. Uh, and uh, this is, I don't have time to go through it in great deal, so I'll just go to the punchline. I wrote a paper uh, last year that demonstrated, so air, like everyone loves energy efficiency, it's supposed to be this great thing where uh, you can save money and save the environment too. Uh, what we found is that the promised savings, energy savings from residential energy efficiency investments were only 39% uh, of, uh, the, of the prompt, the actual were only 39% of the promised savings. Uh, and so it's just important to engage in ground truthing about what works uh, and what doesn't work. Um, Oh, and you can see this was like a calculation that we did that if you were to engage in a energy efficiency investment, uh, the rate of return appears negative. Uh, in contrast, what had been promised from the engineering models was really an um, you know a great rate of return that far exceeds stocks uh, or uh, other potential investments. Okay, and then the last point I'll just make is uh, you know a, no, a big part of the energy challenge is that a lot of the low carbon energy sources really aren't completely ready for prime time yet. Uh, and uh, you can see this, there's been a huge decline in the cost of solar in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, but solar still remains uh, much more expensive than the fossil fuels. And that's not even accounting uh, for their 
intermittency and the cost that that intermittency imposes on the system. There's also been a lot of improvements in batteries. Uh, in fact, Argon Labs is doing uh, really important work uh, at helping to bring that down. Uh, but as we looked at before with respect to internal combustion engines, there's uh, still a long ways to go. Uh, and then, you know, the last thing I'll point is, you know, it, maybe it's not surprising uh, that the low carbon energy sources do not uh, do so great. You know, as a society or as a world, we have not devoted very much to the basic R&D that underlies uh, the advances that are critical uh, for reducing our reliance uh, on fossil fuels.